and we're live what's going on welcome to the ryan stick show today i am here with my old friend lowell dean now uh, before i introduce him a little bit of a little bit of um an introduction years ago at the fantasia film festival there was a movie playing called wolf cop and frankly a movie called wolf cop needs to be watched by someone like me so we sat down and before we even saw the movie we sat we had this interview and really bonded over our love of uh you know what we enjoy about a werewolf movie like all the practical effects and stuff i said i like this guy then i saw the movie i'm like oh thank god i like this movie too because i would have been awkward and uh, you know, kept track of his career with uh, another wolf cop. And um, I, he told me uh, one time I saw that he had a comic book, and I'm like, God, I gotta check this comic book out. And from the first page, I was laughing my ass off. Like this is one of the funniest things I've ever read, and it's also deep. And within the first issue, I found myself kind of tearing up and laughing out loud on a bus. So it was a very awkward time <laughs> pre-covid of course and um now when you would do either people would just be like whatever dude just don't shake my hand but anyway uh now after all these years atomic victory squad found out five issues and to celebrate that i have in person live lowell dean how's it going dude good ryan how are you i'm freaking good dude it's a blast man um so uh yeah um <laughs> all right so uh dudes oh yeah you're not gore let's take care of that <laughs> she's yeah, you're just telling me about that all right so lowell tell me a little bit about how you dreamt up atomic victory squad as i cover up this error <laughs> sure uh first off i would like to acknowledge my covid hair <laughs> <laughs> please enjoy um yeah so uh atomic victory squad was a, a comic book that uh well, before it was even a comic, it was just characters I liked to draw when I was a little kid. And um, I, I was really into making comics and, uh, you know, doodling when I should have been doing schoolwork. And uh, I kind of forgot about it. And as I got older, I was getting back into comic books and I decided I wanted to make some kind of comic book. And I was talking with Emerson Ziffel, uh, who you know, the effects artist behind uh, Wolf Cop, and he was like, you should make Atomic Victory Squad, and those characters are really fun and weird. So um, I looked at them, and I, even though they were made up when I was honestly some of them seven or eight years old, I thought, <laughs> I mean, as a jaded adult, I looked at them and thought, oh, man, this would be so weird to try and get back in the mind space of a child. So, so check it out, everybody. This is Atomic Victory Squad in the present. But uh, thanks to the old internet machine, I managed to nefangle th this, where you could see the original concept art that you were coming up with since you were a kid. Now, yeah, some of those, like the first couple drawings there I did when I was like seven or eight years old, and you know, drawing really simple things that I, a child could draw, like a bubblehead. So um, the characters were one thing when I was a kid, but as an adult, when I wanted to revisit them, uh, probably because of who I am now as an adult, they just became bleaker. Mm and darker and more about their mature adult relationships and society and all that kind of messed up stuff but they're still a flying cow so it's like a weird cross section you gotta love the flying cow now speaking of flying cow uh my favorite character in this book hey maurice roy my that's my favorite character in this book actually <laughs> because you can see his well, name maurice in the is a part of the Tom Richard squad so he is arguably a character in the book yeah you can actually see his name in the credits here i brought i brought a picture of the credits um, <laughs> so, um, basically, uh, yeah, Atomic Victory Squad is a hell of a book, but, uh, what is a comic without its characters? Now you start off this book with the, with the funniest first page ever earth. Duh. <laughs> so automatically, you know, from that first page in, you're like, okay, clearly there's a sense of humor here and this might go off the rails and there's, um, Talk, talk there's talking cat there's talking bulls with cow with cow uh, parts and there's this whole subplot of the story basically about how uh on the cow planet male cows have udders but on earth he was subject to kind of uh criti uh i don't know i don't know what the i don't know what the term is but basically yeah but basically in 2021 it's kind of funny how profound this messages that you convey in this book uh based on you had you ever think that that would reflect on this time now like a bunch of people giving this character crap about having female and male body parts 
No, actually. Um, and that's been one of the coolest little accidents of making this comic because uh, the origin, which is embarrassing but true, is when I made up the character of Invincible, who used to be called Megaboo. I just didn't know that, you know, it was like, it's like thinking that all cats are girls and all dogs are boys, you know? It's like uh, I, I assumed that cows could be male uh, and uh, I didn't know that it was a bull. So, but being a defensive child when people would say, well, that's wrong. I'd be like, no, you just don't know him. You know, like he's from a different planet. <laughs> so that was my rationale. And then that justification as I, you know, revisited the characters in adulthood. Um, yes, obviously like the mm. gender uh, conversation that we're definitely entrenched in now, it made it care like, it made it seem like the character mattered in a cool new way and shouldn't be written off. You know, I shouldn't just change even though it was confusing and going to fan expos, I have people even to this day say that that character is wrong. And I love when they do because they say, please read the comic and see if you feel that way at the end. And I honestly had one person at a fan expo, I gave them the, the comic and they yeah. came back to it like an hour later and said, um, I like this character. I understand now. And uh, that was a cool feeling. Well, yeah. And, espe and especially now too, or it's just like, even a few years ago, uh, kind of even transgender thing, uh, transgender things wasn't really in the pop culture zeitgeist and now it's everywhere and it's, yeah. it, and, and, and that's really cool. And, uh, here's a little comic frame of, uh, you see invincible when he was a kid, he arrived on this planet and he was, uh, kind of a ward, you would say to a Mr. Victory. And you can kind of see the crowd kind of like giving him crap about having, you know, being called cowboy, but having udders. Now, uh, this whole comic book, by the way, is a whole blast. It's a total blast and it's a whole bunch of fun. So everybody out there, don't think it's like full of these like deep political issues. This is kind of like, you know, Lowell's a, a very, Lowell's a smart cookie. And even in Wolf Cop, when it comes to all the boobs and blood and uh, wolf fangs, there's always something underneath it, you know, and all great horror is kind of a, you know, a commentary, a social commentary in a way without, you know, being too uh, heavy handed. So um, the my favorite part about an atomic victory squad is when you find out like how uh invincible comes to earth and i'm going to find a little uh frame of it right here you see he comes from a you still with me lol yeah i'm here all right cool so he he crash lands here and he uh you know you see this beautiful little baby a baby uh cow bull and he's found by this evil farmer and this evil farmer then harvests him for milk <laughs> and uh and basically you know uh, my girlfriend being a level 17 vegan like you know i hear her kind of make these comparisons all the time and that and it's just it's just interesting to see how like in a comic book that i lap my ass off with Bob myers a blast you know he's just a just a total perv jackass drunk <laughs> and then at the same time a page later you know you'll you'll deeply feel something do you have a hard time finding that balance in a book like atomic victory squad that's both touching and hilarious um maybe i don't know i mean i just knew the story <laughs> that i wanted to tell and honestly um i i feel like that tone that weird tone kind of comes naturally to me so I feel more like the comic had to catch up to the times or vice versa, because I remember seeing a few episodes of Futurama that did a really good job with that tone. Uh, yeah. And later shows like Rick and Morty, which can end on like such a downer note. And it's like, you know, nine inch nails music playing and Rick's considering like <laughs> suicide and things like that. And, and then, and then the straw that broke the camel's back for me was Bojack Horseman. When I saw that show, I was like, this is it. This is, this is what I wanted to make. And if these people are all doing it, why can't I? So that's kind of why we kind of really got off our butt and made the comic was because I saw that not only was it possible, but there was an audience for that tone, which often is a confusing tone. And often when I'm pitching things, um, I can see people be like, well, what is it? Which one of these things is it? Which two of these things is it? It can't be eight, you know, but I think like life is eight things, <laughs> you know, one day you're laughing yeah. and the next year on the verge of whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I also think it's really cool that uh, on the planet that Invincible is from is, uh, you know, humans were milked on that planet and his parents were human rights activists. 
<laughs> and sent and sent him uh yeah and when war broke out they sent him to planet earth to find a better life before um, by this evil life and and pure hell to be rescued later on by uh the su- by the super mr victory very fascinating stuff man now um i want to ask you and i'm just going to Oh, my connection's terrible. Yeah, um, can you tell me how Emerson Ziffel convinced you to start this comic book off? Um, he, I mean, we had just gone through making a lot of stuff together. And um, it's always interesting when you, for example, you make a movie. Uh, you're Even if, if you're the creative, you can't just make the movie. You know what I mean? Like a movie requires so many moving parts and pieces and financing. Uh, so I think the push for Atomic Victory Squad um, was, I think Emerson was like, let's just do something that is ours. You know, let's do something yeah. where we don't need to wait for millions of dollars. We don't need to wait for someone's permission. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't need to have like a, a billion people weighing in on like, you have to do this, you have to do that. Yeah. Okay, stuff, you know, um, it was like, let's just take the next good idea you have or the thing you're most passionate about. And let's keep the bar low enough financially that no one can stop us. So um, that is my favorite thing, hands down, about making Atomic Victory Squad. Is, yeah. um It lives and dies quality-wise by how hard we would work on it and what we wanted out of it. And I'm proud of it. And any mistake I look at, I will wear 100%. And it was just like growing pains in me learning how the hell to make a comic. You know, there's panels that I'm like, why did I have that much dialogue? And there are others <laughs> Oh, okay, I'm I'm starting to learn the translation because I wrote this originally as a TV pilot. Um, okay, and then when I was trying to translate it, at first I had that very literal part of my brain that's like, "This has to happen in this." And the freeing part was learning that comics are different, and uh, I still I'm still learning, and I'm loving it. Yeah. Um. So the final issue. Well, final quote unquote final issue right. of Atomic Victory Squad just came out last week. And, or this week, I should say. And, uh, you know, it's been a long time coming. How long has this process been from concept to printed page? Oh, God. Um, I mean, are we counting childhood? Probably not. <laughs> Probably no, I, not. I would say when Emerson kicked you in the ass to uh, present, uh, present day. Um, I'd say 2017, actually. Um, wow. 2017, we were drawing, talking about it. I was, like, telling him uh what the story was and trying to figure out how to adapt my tv pilot into a comic uh okay. 2018 we got serious and we actually you know looked for artists and team members and emerson started designing badges and mm-hmm. i think 2019 we did the first issue actually 2019 we started with the first issue and by the end of the year we had three and then wow. COVID and everything happened so it was definitely these last two issues were a slog and really hard to get going and finished, but you have to understand, I mean, in COVID, you, you know, yeah. everything has to move a little slower. We also didn't crowdfund these last two issues. It was just like, you know, honestly, a lot of it was like Emerson and I paying out of pocket and, uh, you know, everybody works very reasonably. It's, uh, but, you know, you don't want artists to work for free and if you can avoid it. Uh, especially when what they're doing might take weeks of their time. So yeah. we really balance like financial commitments, people's time, people's energy uh, with trying to make it obviously as good as humanly possible. Uh, uh, Maurice is saying something really nice. He's saying Emerson and Lowell, the Cavalier and Clay um, <laughs> of Regina. <laughs> By the way, everybody ignore yeah. this little graphic on the bottom. I kind of realized that I didn't make a, a new background yet. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's that. Um, and that's a good point. Uh, you, and, you and Emerson go way back. In fact, Emerson was did an interview with me once where he told me the story of how he ended up working on Krampus, like my favorite Christmas horror movie ever, and working with the Weta Workshop and all that kind of stuff. That guy, good things has happened to that guy, and he deserves every bit of it uh can you tell me a little bit about what it's like working with emerson when you're not in the trenches you know making a horror movie under uh under the gun you can say and kind of like you know spacing it out using your imaginations when art is kind of lit when the drawn page is kind of limitless when it comes to what you can think of 
Yeah, I mean, um, I think Emerson and I are friends first and foremost, so we actually like love hanging out. Oh, there he is. Yeah, <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we're always just like brainstorming and in the pre-COVID universe, uh, we would go for coffee all the time and uh, just bounce ideas around and he'd ask what I wanted to make, what kind of project, and then he'd start sketching out things and, you know, whether it's a creature or a puppet or something, uh, he's always like tossing uh, ideas and, and trying to figure out um, his kind of superpowers, figuring out how things work. So if I have an idea that I'm like, oh, this is so cool, uh, he'll really bust bust my gears saying like, well, why does this happen? Why does this happen? And sometimes I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, yeah, <laughs> before you can make it. Yeah. And that must be kind of tough too when it comes to, God, I, I don't know how to write a comic book, man. Never have done it. I kind of have an idea of how to kind of like write a movie because I'm a jerk and I criticize enough of them to just, you know, by default, you can kind of think, okay, this is probably what can happen. But then when you get on location, nothing's ever what you think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, coming from that world of kind of just dealing with it, you know, uh, the werewolf blows up, deal with it. Uh, you, you run out of money, deal with it, do this, do that. You mentioned that the last two issues took longer to come. Did it change? the delay in the last two issues did it de delay this did it change the storytelling because you had a little bit extra time to think of, to, to double think about things before uh, publishing no um and that's what's frustrating in a way is um i i am definitely someone who loves immediate gratification so uh, <laughs> okay i love being on set and like uh you know getting something done but yeah as I learned with both comics and film it's the most frustrating part can be having an idea, thinking it's awesome. Yeah. In five years to know if it's good or not, you know, All and, right. uh, and the same thing with the time of victory squad, like um, I wrote issue one and while we were crowdfunding the first issue, as soon as we, I was accepting the fact that it could be one and done, you know, I do the one comic, it's on my bucket list. I could say I made a comic book, but the second we hit our funding goal um, in a weekend, I was like, immediately the way my brain works is i get to do more than one so i started immediately writing issue two um and then we did crowdfunding for two and three and while that was happening i'm already thinking ahead and i wrote four and five so the the most frustrating part for me is this whole comic story has been written for years like in mm -hmm. 2019 i already had issue five written and I didn't really honestly change a lot because even though i would sometimes have like that gut reaction to change things um I'm a, I'm a bit of a purist and I like to think like when my head was in the game and when I mm. was envisioning all five uh issues and thinking this is the story I was in a different place then so I don't like betraying that version of me now and being like well I think this would be cooler because that me was more in the zone of what that whole story had to be so we'll do little things and like the artist will come in like Javier uh who's the artist he'll suggest things or we'll do minor tweaks but um that's more how I like to do it. Like I'm already like starting a new comic now and I'm, I'm trying to think like, it's so weird that I won't get to see this for years. Yeah. That's uh, I get the immediate gratification thing. Um, so with atomic victory squad, uh, who do you say is, uh, you know, are the, these characters like little pieces of you? Because, you know, you, <laughs> you're a very, you're a very uh, smart, well-spoken calm collected individual but wolf cop came from somewhere inside you and so did bubble meyer <laughs> so is there some part of you that kind of wishes you could like let loose like these wild animals you uh seem to write down on paper because uh frank <laughs> frankly besides your hair you're a pretty uh <laughs> you're a pretty calm collected dude uh yeah for sure i mean i think everybody has an animal inside them i wouldn't ever deny that I did. And um, I think, yeah, I, I, parts of all these characters are me. And uh, I would also say that every character is also someone I know too. So I yeah. don't think the best thing about, for me with these characters is none of them is a literal one and one. Like I'm that guy and Emerson's this guy or something. It's, um, there's a little bit of me in all of them. And also I can, I could name you, but I won't in case they're offended. Friends of mine or family members who each have <laughs> influenced the decision making with certain characters. Well, I noticed that you drew some of your crew 
well, some not you, but some of your crew was drawn into the books. And I recall seeing you and um, Emerson uh, in a crowd <laughs> and Emerson's wearing like a, a cow hat <laughs> or a bull hat. And uh, it's, it's funny where, you know, you don't think you'd recognize somebody in drawn form, but I'm like, no, that's them. And yeah. I remember I saw Maurice too. Yeah, and Maurice is an issue too. Yeah, yeah, he's in the dance club, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of funny, like with crowdfunding and stuff like that. Did people get a chance if they when they were crowdfunded? Is that was that one of the prizes that they could be drawn into the issues? Because certain pages I would see a character on screen and I'm just like, I think they gave money because that's yeah, a very you know, clear shot of a background character. It's true. <laughs> it's very it's so true. Like it's yeah. That's one thing that I cringe a little at sometimes, I'm like, it didn't, but it's like, we had to be, you know, if someone pays money to be in a comic, it's got to look like them. But the style I know. is often a little looser. So you're right. When you see, there's certain people who are just so specifically drawn that you're like, okay, that's obviously a person. Um, yeah, yeah, they don't have a bubble for a head. So they, yeah, they yeah, clearly. They're not a cow either. So yeah. but actually, that's funny because one person, multiple people actually who backed uh, we had characters earmarked for them. And then at the last minute, they're like, can you just make it my cat? It's like, okay. <laughs> so that was actually really fun. Uh, we had some cat and dog cameos, which I think worked in this world. Oh my God. I would be like, please draw me being murdered by one, <laughs> by one of these people. It's like, I don't yeah. really want to be murdered in real life, but I always want to be murdered on screen or on page. So, you know, oh, dreams. Really? Okay, cool. Um, so. Yeah, the, a, a, a great thing about this comic book, and like I said, everybody, you got to read this comic book because the complexities of it, where it's just like it could be very deep, but at the same time, it's so funny, so humorous, and I really, I laugh out loud a lot. And I really found that I got a sense of who these characters were, and their dysfunction made them a great group. Like, that's what we kind of always loved about the X-Men, you know? They didn't always kind of get along, but they knew what the, all right, let's get a shot of you doing that they knew what they had to do despite the fact that they weren't always getting along now uh was that the goal from the get-go to kind of make them like uh you know that kind of fun 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 and dysfunction type of team because even the fantastic four i think marvel's first family one of the most appealing things about them instead of the super friends the fantastic four are like they take sh they'll fight over who gets to use the shower <laughs> you know like like a family and that's what that's what really bonded them and sorry for all the existential thoughts but i'm just like this comic book means a lot to me it's really interesting how you took like all these characters that were essentially outsiders and then they found the surrogate family within themselves and, uh, you know, that kind of like connection that they all had based on the fact that they had nowhere else to go or no one else to love them. Was that the intention from the get go? Yeah, um, I would say so. I, I feel like the, I mean, Marvel has a great template with, um, you know, mm. it's about one thing, but it's actually kind of about another. And um, I knew uh, that they were going to be like a, a family because that's you know every team up should be you know whether you're fast and furious with your karamas or what and um i also knew that i wanted each character to not necessarily overtly maybe subconsciously or at some lower level uh represent uh some kind of societal problem or issue or crises or um personal trauma so each character kind of in a way represents you know things like that. Um, but again, I didn't want it to be like so aggressive that it's in your face, but like the invincible um, gender topic, each mm. character has something like that. Um, so I knew yeah. it would be a personal individual thing and then how they work together or didn't work together would be what would be the fun of it more so than the fighting. Cool. Um, Gary, Gary, the mime is a, a great character. <laughs> and uh, is that his name? Gary? I, it is Gary. Okay, just sometimes I put something out there under like his name. It's a forgettable name, and that's why I know Gary. But, the I know, but Gary the mime, who's arguably one of the most powerful members of the group. Uh, there's this. I don't have the image on me, but it's just great where you see him on this kind of like translucent unicorn. And then the narrator thought bubble explains, this is what Gary sees, but nobody else does. <laughs> and uh, how, do, how, do, how does one come up with a, a, a mime with superpowers? 
Um, I think it, it, it just, again, that character for sure goes back to childhood. And because for some reason, you know how there's like, I, I read, maybe it was on Twitter recently, someone said something funny about like, when I was a kid, I thought quicksand was going to be way more important as an adult based on how much we talked about it. Uh, for me, that mimes are like that. I feel like um, mimes were talked about so much more in childhood. And then I grew up and I'm like, do mimes even really exist? And as a kid, I just remember, you know, kids would do the stupid miming, the box and the rope. And then I just had like had an epiphany one day. I was like, oh, imagine if there was a guy who was such a good mime that whatever he did was real, even if you didn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> until it hit you in the head or something, right? So yeah. that was kind of the idea when I was a kid. And then, like, uh, as an adult, I kind of married that with, um, in my head, he was, like, the Green Lantern of the team. You know how Green Lantern is, like, he had that ring and anything uh, he yeah. thought of with him would happen? I thought that yeah. was kind of a cool marriage. So uh, he's, like, the Green Lantern in my head. Awesome. Um, so there's another character here, um, She-Girl. Um, she like a uh, former sex robe, a former sex android, now a badass superhero. Uh, how did you come up with She Girl? Uh, she Girl was one of the first characters because I read a lot of comics as a kid, and even as a, a young uh, heterosexual male, I was very aware of how sexist it was uh, that every female superhero seemed to have to wear half as much as the men. You know, mm. and, uh, every even in the comic, depending on the artist or who was drawing it, there's like butt shots and boob shots. And I mean, again, I was like, on the one hand, I'm like, wow, I enjoy reading comics. But on the other <laughs> hand, I know this is like kind of skeezy in some ways. And yeah, why does the so so to me, I, I know when I, it's like in again hindsight in 2021 or 2020, I was like, only after we started the comic, I'm like. Is, is this too on the nose? Are people going to be offended that I call her she girl? You know, like, <laughs> that was, uh, well, you know, like the, the whole point, the other thing that offended me is like every character is this weird kind of subconscious uh, Batman, Batgirl, you know, Superman, Supergirl, like Hulk, she Hulk. I don't know. It just felt like yeah. it was over simpli simplification and like uh, a minimizing uh, of uh, women in comics. So I thought like, I wanted to make the most powerful character uh, also like uh, uh, have a really like ridiculous name and be literally like a, a tool of a male. Uh, so until, I mean, I don't want to get into spoilers, but her whole journey and her whole point is like to uh, become her own uh, character, her own, in charge of her own future and identity. And uh, for sure, uh, what a great, what a great arc, what a great character. And I, I kind of love it how at one point in the series, you got a bunch of people who are pretty much humans who turned into something else, but you have Invincible and She-Girl who have never were human, living in a human's world, who exuberate the most human, uh, exuberate what it means to be human more than the others do. And uh, I think that I think it's a I think it's a beautiful comic. I think it's a really cool story. And I, I really encourage everybody out there to actually kind of buy these issues. I mean, there's uh, there's thoughts right about making a, a graphic novel at some point. Be, but yeah. issue number five just came out, and I, I would really suggest that everybody in the meantime kind of buy these individual comics. Where can people buy copies of Atomic Victory Squad? Great question. Um, uh, right now, they're for sale on our Indiegogo store. That's kind of the one-stop shop. Um, pretty easy to find. Uh, Tom Victory Squad, uh, you know, you search that in Indiegogo, you'll see. Um, and you can buy everything there, all the digital issues, all the, you know, we ship worldwide if you want, like the paper issues, uh, print issues. And uh, if you want the, if you only want digital, uh, they're on Comixology issues one to four right now, and five will be up later, but yeah, no, we, we're definitely thinking about a graphic novel now that we have this first story. But uh, yeah, if you're a true comic fan or a true comic collector, I wouldn't discourage anyone from getting uh, these wonderful issues because, like, once uh, once you know we we sell out, it's going to be a limited edition of this one. And then uh, uh, is that a is that a know, variant cover of number five? It is. Yeah, that's the variant mm. cover. So there's there's two covers for issue five. Um, v for variant. Yes, exactly, and uh, and five be Roman numeral for five. Uh, my favorite, my favorite covers uh, from issue four, where it's the lethal weapon pose with Gary the Mime and Bubblemire. 
Yeah, I love that one too. I oh. I just I just think the colors pop so much. Like if you could put that on a t shirt with the oh with good the, idea. With the green and the red, like, oh my god, that pops up so much because it screams the 80s to me, like 80s action movie. Great. That's a good idea. Um, yeah. And, and but I mean, <laughs> graphic novel, no, we are going to, uh, yes, Emerson will be the one who makes those shirts. So yes, Emerson, <laughs> go for it. Uh, we are going to do uh, the graphic novel, but uh, Maurice, who's going to assemble it, is very you know aware that people may have the issues. So, so we're already brainstorming, like, well, how do we make the graphic novel really value added? There's a by story. by adding by adding an or by adding like a invincible one shot or something. Like, how does one right. become? He he literally was like a Robin type character and became Superman. Like that doesn't happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Like like he's a boy wonder tying up perps with rope to being able to bust through walls with natural ability like that, that and, and walking away from humanity for a while and kind of getting discouraged and just tr maybe even from the rescue to, you know, putting on the invincible costume for the first time. That, that's the type of shit in my mind. I, that I, I just really want to fucking see. I, I want to know like why and how, the superhero becomes the super the super the super psychic becomes the superman and all that shit but but there's so much other stuff to the stories too because you made some really great fucking characters that have like layers to them and stuff like that and um you know bubble meyer like i love those later issues because you get a sense of what's underneath the dome essentially he's not just the comedic guy that you know makes the jokes and stuff like that because clearly anybody and you can see this with any stand-up comedian like robin williams or anything some of the funniest people in the world are masking the most amount of pain yeah. and uh bubble meyer is no exception to uh that rule it's true he's uh mm -hmm. he's probably the most messed up of them all but um with like everybody with good reason right no one's just messed up yeah um, so, uh, I don't want to talk about spoilers because these last issues, the last issue just came out and the other issues are just, you know, sometimes just finding out that the fact and coming into it on your own is the best way. Um, I remember like watching <laughs> even, even Captain America, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Like I found, I find comic book news sites kind of sometimes print thing just cause they want the clicks. They kind of, they kind of publish things before the world can even see the information before it's kind of given to you. And I, I think anything's a spoiler. If someone said to me, the last episode of some show sucked, I'd be like, that's a spoiler. Cause mm -hmm. I'm watching the show and instead of being fresh, I'm just like, but why did it suck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just that type of guy. So I don't believe in spoilers. So everybody out there, just, just note that this is a journey you want to go on. And especially considering this is kind of like, this isn't your run of the mill, Batman, Spider-Man legacy character that's been around for 40 years. These are characters that are fresh and new and they can belong to you. Like when you find that great indie band before they sell out and make albums that nobody and makes their black album, you can be, this is our mixtape, ladies and gentlemen, we can share this around the playground. This, this comic book can be that music that your parents might hate and how fun it is to ingest so um support the atomic victory squad in its infancy because who knows when this graphic novel comes out it might it might go into the stratosphere we don't fucking know yet but that's but that's the best part about comic books because even in 20 years some fucking real famous fuck can pick it up and say shit we should make this into a cartoon and speaking of did you ever envision this uh comic book to be a cartoon a hundred percent. Yeah, I actually, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, I wrote this as a cartoon. Um, I I was actually pitching it as an animated series uh, before years before I even made Wolf Cop. Before I had any any credits on the IMDb, I was like, let's make this cartoon. And uh, animation producers were like, why are you in our office? Who are you? So <laughs> uh, yeah, no, honestly, the comic book is a beautiful thing, but. My mm. long con has always been. I see this as an animated series. We're gonna. I'm gonna ask you about uh, your new comic book, The Odds, in just a bit, because Maurice is a very wise man. But um, I do want to ask you. Uh, you know, speaking of Invincible, B U L L. Let's talk about Invincible for a second, which yeah. I think is actually a better 
a better representation of the material than the comic book actually, because it's actually kind of an improvement where Robert Kirkman was figuring out his voice as a writer in the first few issues of invincible, the first 16, you know, you go back to that and here he is with 16 years of, of experience and able to put it back into the same story with a stronger, uh, a stronger voice, a stronger voice and uh, all these dramatic moments that I that were in the cartoon presently, uh, mm-hmm. I read I read in the issues, and I'm like, oh, it's okay, you know, it's like a it's a page or two, and you're like, oh, I guess that's kind of intense. <laughs> but meanwhile, and you know, everyone who's seen the show, uh, yeah. uh, in the in the cart in the versus the comic book, w- that's kind of like some panels where some words are said. In the cartoon, it's holding your face in front of a train. <laughs> well, for those of you who haven't seen Invincible the show yet, you got you definitely got to check it out. That's not really ruining anything, but it's uh yeah, it's no, I, uh, yeah. I just finished binging it and um yeah. I loved it and it's just another, you know, another notch on the it's possible scale for me. You know, when I see a cartoon like that, uh animation is changing, uh the maturity level of what animation can be. People, you know, even 5 years ago it's like Cartoons are for kids. It was still being said, and now uh, I don't think it's a given. I think you can do so many different tones and styles, and uh, I loved Invincible. Yeah, and in fact, one of the first ones that comes to memory, I think Kick-Ass was like one of those first like funny, violent movies yeah. that I think invent. I I think Atomic Victory Squad could kind of find their way into, like Kick-Ass meets invincible like people people like first of all gore doesn't shock anyone anymore now it's up now it's because your gore isn't gratuitous in this comic book it's actually a way of storytelling like you know spo- spoilers to this there the reason why there's an atomic victory squad right now is because the old team you know uh something very unfortunate happened to them but it's also very like jaw dropping and shocking almost to see that oh shit you're gonna go there in the first cool. issue and the death of the original Atomic Victory Squad was very, not gratuitous, but very, um, you know, you used gore as a, as a storytelling factor. Did you ever think that you should hold back on that? Or is that your wolf cop sensibilities coming out and saying, no, these fuckers are going to die. They got to die hard. Yeah. No, I thought like um, it's not filled with gore, this comic, but I knew that that moment early on had to be over the top so that people knew what you're capable of like i believe that's a good use of gore both in film and in you know comics or whatever i think if you are going to be a thriller or a horror or something you don't always have to be over the top but if you are going to play with that field you should do it early so that when people see it that's in the back of their head now every scene moving forward they're like oh god they showed me something so horrific and (laughs) even if you don't do it they're aware you're capable of doing that to them yeah, uh, I'm actually very squeamish when I watch uh, movies. I'm the person who covers his eyes or is under a blanket uh, when I'm watching a, a really violent. <laughs> movie. Really, yeah. you? <laughs> I know, but it's something different when I see how it's being made. Is this one of those like those who can't do teach moments where you're like you uh you know you can't watch gore happen, but at the same time you and like you know you direct you direct it so well. I think I direct gore and use gore because I know what it does to me and mm. I'm a bit of a jerk. So I like inflicting uh, good feelings and bad feelings. And I know when I watch a show, like for example, I'm, I'm rewatching the Nick right now and there's like some really gnarly surgery scenes and stuff like that in there. And uh, I can barely look at it. And uh, I know the, what, the what, what is the, it? Nick, the uh, you know, the show, the Nick it's a uh, Clive Owen. It's a uh, turn of the century, uh, early medical show steven Soderberg. really no never heard of it well oh, check it out if you like yeah. steven Soderbergh, uh, so he directed all all the first uh, both seasons i think and uh okay yeah, when i see gore it really impacts me so that's why when i have the chance to make gore uh mm. i love it and i really take it seriously and i like that's why things happen like the wolf cop transformation because i'm like i want every time a guy goes to a urinal they have a split second thought about like about their penis exploding into a yeah. into a werewolf dick. Exactly. <laughs> Spoilers. Um, okay. Speaking of speaking of that, and um, we got to talk about that new comic book that's in the works in a little bit. But last night, uh, recently on Shutter, and 
big thanks to my buddy Yannick who uh, who is lending me a watch his shutter and I give him my Disney. Um, so uh, I was watching Joe Bob Briggs uh, and and it's this section where it's 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 called just Joe Bob because I love it. I love his commentaries on the movies and I usually fast forward through some of the movies that I've already seen in order to just get the commentary and I was putting on the strictly the uh, to my delight the wolf cop one where he covered wolf cop and he, he, he had a lot to say about Canada and going on. And he's just like, it's, it was so cool to be like, Lowell Dean is the horror film <laughs> is the horror film. Fran- uh, God, oh God, what was he saying? The horror film. Uh, I don't fucking know. Yeah. But basically he was giving you credit for being like the, like, pretty much the horror f- film industry in Saskatoon. He, he, could, he couldn't get over that. It was really fucking funny. What well, did, when did you find out that you, uh, that Wolf Cop was going to be featured on the last drive-in? I didn't know. I mean, and here's the thing is I watched the last drive-in and, uh, I, I'm aware of Joe Bob. I mm. didn't watch it that week. It wasn't on my radar. I was at Avengers Endgame. I went to the <laughs> Avengers, and so I was in the theater and I'm trying to get into Endgame, and my phone keeps vibrating, um, and it's driving me crazy. And I'm like, someone must have died because, the, like, I, it, my phone is ringing nonstop. So yeah. um, I literally get so bad. I say, I got to step out into the, the hallway, and I do. And I see like it's like Twitter mentions and like a bunch of my friends emailing me and calling me. And uh, then obviously I'm just distracted for the whole rest of the movie, being like, what the hell's happening? So. <laughs> uh, we go home and we watch it the next day and i'm just like you know obviously overjoyed and your heart fills up hearing people talk about something you did and, and talking about it kindly and um and doing their research like that's the coolest thing about joe bob is like uh even schlocky movies even bad movies he finds the good in all of them and uh it's he you know our movie and movies like wolf cop are very easy to dismiss and say that's just some stupid camp um, yeah. just the research he put in and uh, the kindness and the understanding he had for what we tried to do um, just makes you feel good. You know, it makes you feel like, man, thank there are times when you're like, I can't believe I wasted five years of my life on Wolf Cop. And every <laughs> then you're like, well, no, moments like that are like, this is pretty cool. I thought it was really cool that uh, the Wolf Cop premiere at Fantasia, you were passing out Wolf Cop badges to the audience. I still have mine. Emerson made those. Yeah, he sent them um, on the plane. Is there Emerson? Is there anything Emerson can't do? Probably, probably a lot of things, but he'll just yeah. never tell us. By the way, Emerson Ziffel, everybody, if you want to have a good time, uh, go on IMDb and look up Emerson Ziffel because every few years I see that he's working on stuff that I like love. <laughs> I believe he worked on that that Power Rangers movie that came out a few years ago. And, uh, it's just, it's just crazy. Like to him, it's just like, oh yeah, you know, it's a job and he's a really nice guy. I'm like, man, if I had his career, I'd be such an asshole. I'd be like, yeah, guys worked on power Rangers, no big deal. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> but, uh, no, I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't, it, it, I think that maybe that's why he keeps getting higher than the, what a workshop welcomed him with open arms because he's just like that guy. He's the same guy, like, you know, working on wolf cop at 4 a.m. Yeah. It, in the colds in the col- in the colds of Canada as he would be in a large studio, you know, same same humble hard working dude. Well, it's just he likes the work and the work is fun. So it's like it's not work. It's just creating weird mm. crazy stuff. Yeah. I might have gotten the power engine thing wrong. Anyway, Emerson works on good <laughs> Emerson works on great shit. Um so uh okay, let's talk about the uh, let's talk about let's talk about the odds. Sure. Here's the here's this new comic book, you know, that, uh, you know, is is after the Atomic Victory Squad walks away in victory. What are the odds of another comic book coming out so soon? Uh, n- nice. <laughs> uh, not so soon. Um, yeah. But, uh, soon enough that it'll be the next thing uh, we do. Uh, the same kind of collective family behind uh, Atomic Victory Squad will will be a part of it. And um Again, it's uh, it's an idea that I had, and it's a TV pilot I wrote, and it's um, it's a project that I mean I, I get to work at a certain budget level as a director, and 
the odds is something that I wrote and I knew immediately like, well, unless I sell this to Netflix or somebody uh, much more successful than me, this show is not getting made. And after the experience of uh, AVS, I was like, well, screw it. I'll just make a comic book. And then at least it exists and I can, it'll be an easier pitch tool again if I do try and get it as a series. So uh, I don't really want to say anything about the odds beyond the fact that it's a team. It's another team kind of style thing. It's a mm -hmm. piece. Um, it's not superheroes and it's darker and more serious and more violent. And it's probably a closer cousin to Wolf Cop, but without the silliness. Okay. Um, so, uh, oh, Emerson is just making sure uh, it's just clearing up. Yes, he did work. He did work on, uh, Power Rangers, which is fucking great. Anybody my age from my generation just loves Power Rangers. And you know what? We're talking about how sometimes comic books can turn around and make great TV. You know, I I love classic Power Rangers, you know, but story wise, it was pretty fucking re it was pretty fucking repetitive. It's like going to Wendy's every day and ordering the number one, no matter what. Uh, you know, you're gonna get this, you're gonna get this, they're gonna fight, they're gonna get big, and this is gonna happen. And uh, the human stories are pretty light because they have to understand that, you know, nine-year-olds could be watching. So, you know, be funny, get to the fighting, move on. Recently, I've been reading this comic book that Kyle Higgins uh, wrote, and it's Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but it's in it's the same 90s team, but more not real life stuff happening, but they'll show panels of Billy working inside the Zord, you know, making the T-Rex leg work better or um, Tommy in another dimension took the white uh, after he got freed from Rita Repulsa's like, you know, spell decided to still be with Rita. And they, they both in this other timeline took over the world and he grabbed and he grabbed the green uh, Power Ranger coin and the white Power Ranger coin and smashed them together and became this like you know this uh, world killing badass and it's like all this kind of stuff from a really I though I love it a really kind of like campy over the top fun but for kids 90s cartoon and for it to hit me this way as 37 years old and just be struck by how fucking interesting all these stories are and how and the real and having them have higher stakes and feeling like there's true danger in it for characters that i've known for 30 years but at the same time this is a way i've never actually experienced them before and in a way i actually prefer it's kind of funny how the opposite can happen where you could take something a little campy and then you can put the spin on it and like, you know, ha put it through a different lens and make it m even more enjoyable for like, uh, for someone who's lived with it his whole life. And for what I understand, the show Battlestar Galactica had a similar effect where they're like, let's take this old movie that was considered shitty Star Wars <laughs> and change it do all this other stuff and then become beloved and be like one of the greatest sci-fi TV shows of all time. I haven't seen it yet, but all my colleagues and friends live and, die, live and die by it. Yeah. It's funny you say that because it's true. It's like you mature and then the material matures with you. Yeah. Do you think that Atomic Victory Squad would ever be seen in a different type of light or do you think it's destined to kind of be like that adult swim uh, nineties, nineties, ni uh, late nineties, uh, late night superhero cartoon. Oh God, I have no idea. I mean, it would depend on uh, who was collaborating on it and uh, the market and the audience and where they wanted to go with it. You know, like for me, um, I see the characters a lot of different ways. You know, I see it being like a softer. Uh, Saturday morning family friendly message version. I think my dream version is more Rick and Morty meets Bojack where, uh, you know, you have these crazy adventures and space things, but you are going to have those moments of like, maybe for 10 minutes, it's just two people sitting in a room talking about their feelings, you know, uh, I would love that version. Um, but then I also see like a big budget, uh, spider verse, uh, feature version where it's like insane animation and like the characters are like coming to life. So. I don't know. I, I never say never. And I, I mean, first off, I'd just be happy to get it as an animated show. But secondly, I think um, I think it can go a lot of ways. But to me, this the superpower of the show right now is that blend of big, colorful fun and, and deep rooted social trauma. Um, 
considering it a car a cartoon, if you could take any famous celebrity voice and kind of put it uh put their voice in the in the mouth of your characters, who do you think Bubble Meyer would sound like if you could take any, you know, comedic voice actor, or comedian or actor and uh, get him to voice? That's tough. I mean, it's an obvious answer, but I feel like Will Arnett because he was Bojack and like that kind of brash. <laughs> oh my god, that's really good. You know, that asshole like he's really good at that. Like I don't care about anything, but secretly I'm heartbroken that we just did this. Uh, I think he'd be great. Um, it's I, funny how he sounds like a Beetlejuice, but by himself. <laughs> yeah, he just got it's that. Like, hey, rough, hey, check this out, man. Check this out, man. Yeah, it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, someone like that, right? It doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 I was picturing Jason Mandukas, who uh, plays Rex Blode. Oh, God. Yeah, I love him. He's oh, my God. He's so funny. <laughs> actually, I could picture Rogan, uh, Seth Rogen actually doing him really well, too. Just just somebody who's like really good at riffing, I, I guess, right? But yeah. Invinci- Invincible, I don't know. Like, what do, what do you hear for Invincible? He's actually the only character who I've always pictured a certain voice, and it's uh, weirdly Lawrence Fishburne, you know? I could see that. Yeah, I always, I mean, since the last five years, who knows who's the right voice now, but that's just who I feel. Like. Yeah, like someone wise, yeah. someone wise beyond their years, like an older wise voice, or even, um, because I was going to say the gentleman who voiced Spawn in the 90s, but even he is a little too dark, mm-hmm. like, or too deep. So, because he voiced Goliath and, um, I can't believe I'm spacing on his name because I fucking love him so much. But um, yeah, he vo- he voiced Goliath and Gargoyles. So like that deep voice. But I'm like, no, I totally get it. Lawrence Fishburne, way better. Yeah, yeah. Because because he has just as much um, dramatic intensity, but at the same time, you're not distracted by the bass. Yeah, and he can also be warm and quiet, but he's like, you know, really good at that uh, authoritarian, uh, but over it kind of voice. Now, um, in your life as a director, do you ever feel like Triangle Master, Lowell? Because uh, <laughs> I guess everybody feels like Triangle Master one one day. Uh, who who would you picture voicing Triangle Master? Uh, good question. Um, I don't know why, but I immediately think Steve Buscemi. <laughs> you know? Like that kind of like <laughs> older, uh, like really stable, <laughs> but also like enthusiastic, but maybe he can go on and on, you know, or like a Zach Galifianakis type, you know, like it's a, it's, it's a guy who's like, has a lot to say. And after about two sentences, you realize you should probably back out of the room. (laughs) Okay. All right. And, um, sorry, uh, forgive me. Um, the name of the, of, uh, who she can change into the animals. What's her name again? Susanna. Susanna. Right. Susanna. Um, Susanna, who do you picture playing Susanna? God, that's a tough one. Um, I, I've honestly never imagined who could play Susanna. So, I mean, the, the only person who I know would probably would play Susanna because she made me uh, already commit to it is uh, Amy Matissio, who plays Tina in Wolf Cop. Oh, fuck uh, yeah. She does animated voices. Uh, like, that's a big part of her acting right now. And, and she basically said, like, I'm Susanna. So. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Internet, but I'm pretty sure that she is in this Canadian made TV show called, Oh my God, what the fuck is it called again? It's these people that carve wooden ducks and, and they're all take, and they're all in this competition and they take it super fucking seriously. And, um, Karen Maliki Sanchez from catwalk and ready or not, he's in it too. And it's really, or I think she was in the, I think she was in maybe not the series, but like the pilot for it or something. Anyway, it's, it's so fucking funny and it's called decoys. So uh, anyway, check it, check it out. Check it out. Uh, decoys on CTV, everybody, the CTV app. It's really fucking funny to see how serious all these people take that, like the, the duck carving competition. And I think that's like what makes comedy really work. It's not, everybody's not like, <laughs> hey, here's the joke. Get it? It's just like no, they'll say something ridiculous, but like Steve Carell, they'll commit to it, you know, and they won't flinch and then just let everybody laugh while they, you know, remain straight. Um so, oh, that's true. Triangle Master could be weird out. <laughs> <laughs> 
Call me. Yeah. Um, so fuck. It's been a few years since Wolf Cop two came. Uh, another Wolf Cop came out. Is there any yeah. plans on making kind of like a third Wolf Cop? Because you and I uh, threw many beers at Fantasia Film Festival, kind of discussed how you did have a plan for a third Wolf Cop movie. Yeah, so how drunk did you get me if I was telling you Wolf Cop three? Pretty drunk, <laughs> and um, I didn't get you drunk. You got me drunk. It was no. <laughs> it was the Wolf Cop party that I was really happy to be at. That was a good time, with Fantasia. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's I, if you would have asked me five years ago, I'm like, please don't talk to me about Wolf Cop. I need to go do something else. But um, I don't know. It's tough because like I love the character. I love the cast. They're all like legit my friends. So um, I would love to do a, a, a third, another, another Wolf Cop, but. Um, <laughs> no immediate plans you know i have i know what i would want to do um unfortunately it's bigger budgets at least a little bit bigger than like the first couple so it would yeah. be at least three million dollars to do and i don't okay. know usable but uh yeah no i'm not like i'm not running to do it tomorrow but i wouldn't be sad if someone said hey you want to make wolf cut through i'd be yeah stoked. Um, big shout out to, and I've never interviewed him, never talked to him, but I fucking love him. And he's a great Canadian actor. And Joe Bob was praising the shit out of him. Uh, Jonathan Cherry, who is one of the fucking funniest people. Um, he's in this, he's in one of my favorite hockey movies ever, the goon. And it's really funny. So it's like, Hey, got only two fucking rules. Don't touch my Percocets. And do you have any fucking Percocets? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's Jonathan Cherry. When you made another Wolf Cop, his character dies in the first movie, but did you know from the get-go that we have to fucking get him back in the movie somehow? Like, if we're going to make a second one, like, Jonathan Cherry has to be in this. Yeah, that was tough. Um, I actually didn't want to kill him in the first one. <laughs> I, uh, okay. It, it was not in my uh, original script that that character would die. Um, but then through rewrites and uh, working with the producers, they really wanted to... Uh, him to well i guess we're spoiling things but he wanted they wanted him to be involved in a certain conspiracy so um mm. i played along um and i you know it was it, it did feel like a fun thread to pull on but it really was heartbreaking for me to have his character uh end up how he does in the first one so mm. um, no i knew like but the best part is when you are making a movie as dumb or as weird as wolf cop mm you can pretty much do whatever you want, right? And like probably the one of the biggest disservices you can do is to overanalyze and say, this could never happen. It's a cop becomes a werewolf. I can do whatever I want if I can make it make sense in this world, right? So no, I knew immediately, like I wouldn't want to do a sequel without him the same way I wouldn't want to do another one without uh, he and Leo and Amy, you know, like to me, like those three and their kind of triangle energy dynamic is, the fun of, of uh, at least the first two films. So yeah, yeah. I to see what they'd be up to and how they'd be interconnecting. Yeah. Um, so the future, the future is still unwritten. Uh, is there, a, what would you say is like your, um, you know, and not to spoil end game everybody, but uh, what's your slow dance? What, what's your <laughs> slow dance? What's your slow dance with Peggy Carter? Like what's your, what, what's your happy, what's your happy what's ending? Slow dance with Peggy Carter. That's it. Yeah, uh, yeah exa I exactly. I don't know if I have a happy ending. Does it, does it have to be happy? Well, no, it's just kind of like, you know, uh, if you if you can say after everything, it'd just be like you see yourself closing your eyes for the last time and you can visualize the world uh, the world in which you could could picture it in without without any cynicism. Can you think like we made five wolf cops atomic victory squad becomes the leading cartoon on amazon prime like what you know just put something out in the universe because you never fucking know man those would be fun but i think like i don't i, think I said once upon a time i'm like t someday i'm gonna kiss a girl and it happened lol it happened because i believed well then that's what that's all <laughs> i want no uh i i think like I mean, maybe I'm just getting old, but like, I, I don't like, I would like to make a lot more movies and TV shows and I have personal little goals, but I feel like my life bucket list would be beyond film. You know, I'd be like just having a good life and being nice to people. Right. But, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I think like in terms of projects, um, if you want that answer, I would like to make one movie that I like. That's it. Like really like, and I'm like, I'm proud of this. Okay. Um, or a TV show. Uh, but TV show is a long con, so it's a lot harder. Um, I'd like to have a series. I'd like to make one movie that was like, if I die in like a, you know, some intense way, you can watch that. And it says everything I feel about life. But um, mm. that might be a tolerable. I get what you're saying, though. When you get older, like when I was a kid, I'm like, I want to be a fucking rock star. I want to be a millionaire. And I'm thinking, yeah, millionaires, millionaires get taxed a lot. Like, <laughs> um, I'm like, nah, man, I want to die happy. I think that's the big difference. You know, because well, like, priority yeah. shift, right? If you would have asked yeah. me that money, I was like, I want to die right now. I want to die in a violent blaze of glory. You know, I wanted to be John McClane. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> like now i'm just like it'd be nice to just do something worthwhile that's all yeah but, well okay you know what maybe from your perspective you don't you know i it, we're very similar in a sense where if i have any success and someone's like hey man congratulations you did this i will immediately humble it by saying well, yeah, but it's like, you know, if I won this, it's because three people entered or like, you know, I like we're, neither of us are those type of people who are just like walking a room and being like, guess what? I just want, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm an award winning blah, 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 blah. And I did this, this, this and this That's a normal it's, reaction. I think I, know. Like, I don't trust anybody who leads with why they're great. You know? I know. It's like, here's why you should listen to me. Um, Dude, I've met people where I've walked in the room. And I've talked to them. And after walking away, I said, holy shit, I fucking met this person. They got a podcast network. They got all this. They got all that. And then you look at what they have. And you're like, you have less views than me. What, 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 why are you so proud? <laughs> and, to, and But I come from that school, man, where I'm just like, I don't know, man. I'd just rather work hard, hope for the best, and uh, you know, not be full of shit about it, I guess. I don't know. And yeah, it's, it's not it, about and, the views. It's about the emotional views. I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But fuck, I don't, I don't care if I have a million views. I just give a shit about talking to an old friend like you, having some fucking fun, and praising a comic book that needs to be praised like Atomic Victory Squad. I encourage everybody out there to buy those issues because in 10, 20 years, you could be that person that bought Metallica's demo tape. Just remember that. You know, <laughs> someday, some, once upon a time, Every huge rock star or every huge rock star artist was just a person drawing or just a people playing in a garage. So, you know, might as well get them on the ground floor. Why not support Atomic Victory Squad? Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Very kind words. <laughs> All right. Well, right now, I believe uh, it's a good time to end. We've been on about an hour. So, uh, Lowell, where can people buy? Uh, just reiterate, where can people buy your shit? Uh, Indiegogo, Indiegogo store. We've uh, got a site up, uh, very easy to find. Atomic Victory Squad's on Facebook, it's on Twitter, it's on Instagram. All those places will drive you to where you can buy the comic. And uh, beyond that, uh, I mean, that's it. The movies are easy to find. They're on iTunes. And Righteous, Righteous Choice. <laughs> Janine yes. Garofalo, uh, Garofalo for Zuana. That's fucking great. Um, yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I believe that's about time. We'll go off into that good night. Thanks very much for watching my stupid show uh, with my awesome guests. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lowell, thanks so much for coming by, dude. It's been great catching up. And congratulations on completing this journey. Because despite the fact uh, COVID and all this other fucking stuff's happening, uh, you got it done, man. I never... I, never I never get a haircut. And I chose to work on the comic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, wait. Okay, my hair is long as fuck, too. Is it that you don't want anybody to touch you? Or is are you just saying, no, let's, well, let's see how far this can go? It's let's a little of both. I mean, I actually, okay. this is insane. I actually have cut my hair during the pandemic. I okay. cut it, um, like, six months ago. But honestly, yeah, it's a little bit of, like, let's see how far we can ride this. So, uh, yeah. sometimes I have it in a man bun. Sometimes I'm... I usually, if I'm doing a Zoom, I wear a hat. Uh, okay. Two, but, uh, well, well, I was before, too, and now I'm totally cousin itting. But uh, That's what I decided to do. Yeah. I decided to let my freak flag fly and show you just exactly what I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, let's interview. Let me come on the show again in six months, and let's see how far, let's see how far we let this go. 
I can't do it, Ryan. I, I, I feel like <laughs> I'm a month away from a haircut. At <laughs> okay. I'm breaking. I, I think, I, I think, uh, okay. Look, fuck, whatever internet. You're gonna catch a you're gonna catch a raw, honest fucking moment. Uh, but I will say this, and I've been saying this to people. People are like, "Why the fuck are you growing your hair?" And I'm like, "You know, for the last ten years, I've had short hair with fucking bleach in it and all that stuff." But that guy who had that hair was going to comic cons, was going to Fantasia, was on co- was on stage playing concerts. That is the hey, look at me hair because I fucking need something to be. You know, when you're in an entertainment aspect, you need people to look at you. If I was sitting here by myself with that fucking hair and looked in the mirror, all I will remember is the way the world used to be that it is not now. So it is a constant duality of remembering what things were and accepting what things are now. I don't want, I don't feel like that guy that wants to everyone to look at him. You know what I mean? So I, you I know, I want remember what jeans feel like. Yeah. <laughs> I want people to look at you. I want people to pay attention to the guests and shit, but it, it, just in general, it's just like, I, you know what? Fuck, I'll cut my hair again. I'll bleach it again. When the fucking world, when thousands of people can go in the same fucking room anymore and not feel fucking stressed out, that's when I'll fucking do it. But not now. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to live in the now, man. And, th- and then I'm 37. So maybe when I'm like 39 and I cut and bleach my hair, I'll be like, I look fucking stupid. <laughs> why am i doing this yeah but uh thanks man uh and that was an honest moment ladies and gentlemen it takes about an hour to get through and a little bit of uh and a little bit of liquid courage but uh you know it fucking happens yeah all right everybody oh and uh yeah and uh Cro- maurice can you confirm this are you just saying that it uh that it avs will be a captain quebec soon is this wishful thinking? Is this positivity you're putting out in the world? Or is this fucking happening? Because if not, I will fight for this. I will uh I'm a big Atomic Victory Squad fan, and I think it'll I think it'll improve everybody's week. I think it'll actually make your hair grow like the peanut butter solution, oddly fast, in a way you want. And uh it will like, you know, make angels give angels wings and make babies smile and all that other stuff. By Atomic Victory Squad, everybody. It's fucking great. And uh, do you have any of those invincible uh, statues left? B U L L? I don't even have one. Uh, no? Emerson made them, and for some reason he said, I give these to people who matter, and I didn't get one. So <laughs> I hope he'll make me one. I, this is my public plea that I can get one of those maquettes. But uh, yeah, no. Uh, indie- he can't confirm. Oh, they will. Right. They will be in a Montreal comic book store. That's fucking great. And you know what, dude? When that happens and stuff like that, we're holding Atomic Victory Squad. Not only on the live auctions on Captain Quebec, I will, I will talk about it con- relentlessly. But yeah. uh, you know, I want some Atomic Victory Squad swag to wear yeah. during okay. this. Thing. Well, uh, well, you already heard Emerson say he's going to make that shirt. So nice, nice. But I, I, I think I got to get one of those invincible statues one of these days, man. I don't know. Yeah. The character, know. The character touched my heart, man. That guy's been through some shit. Yeah, he really has. And people and humanity suck, but at the same time, he's still there to save them. Fucking love that, man. Yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody. So thanks for watching Ride Stick Show. It's been a fucking blast. Lowell, it's been fucking great. Stick around. Uh, let's have some after show chat. But in the meantime, in between time, support Atomic Victory Squad. Go on Instagram. Like their shit. You guys have so much cool stuff coming out of your Instagram account. And uh, you know what? That graphic novel might be in the future. Well, it will be in the future at some point. But when it does, let's uh, let's light a fire under that's at- under its ass. Let's spread it around like a Metallica mixtape in 1983. And let's have some fucking fun, dudes. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.